Good morning, everyone. Today we'll discuss about hygienic and safe milk production practices, including steps for the prevention and control of milk contamination, adulterants, antimicrobial residues. Uh, this class is uh, divided into two. So today we are going to discuss about only the uh, hygienic practices that are need to be uh, followed from production to the supply, that is uh, supply to the ultimate consumers. So those steps we'll study, followed by uh, the memory infections, okay, the overview of the memory infections that we'll study. Okay. In the subsequent class, we'll discuss about uh, the adulterants, the residues, the agrochemicals, and other kinds of uh, chemical hazards that could be introduced into the milk supply chain and that have profound public health implications. So, so let us uh, start with our uh, part one of uh, uh, this lecture, that is a uh, hygienic and safe milk production practices and uh, the subclinical mastitis and other uh, other infections. As we all know that good quality milk is a requirement in the today's uh, uh, market. The milk which is of uh, high quality or good quality, that is uh, 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 that the product prepared out of such a milk will be they are of elite or superior class. The taste will be good, the flavor will be good, and uh, such a milk is free from the pathogens, the contaminants, and the keeping quality of such milk is also high. So this, these are all the benefits of the good quality milk. So this is what we intend to produce, okay? And you just remember that good quality dairy products cannot be manufactured from the inferior quality milk. So for superior quality milk products, you should have good quality or superior quality milk. That is the requirement. Okay, next. No. The quality when we talk about, the quality here it refers to the milk should be free from any debris and sediment. So what is that debris? The debris comes from this, let it be the animal hair, let it be the, uh, the, the uh, feed material from the manger, the fly, the insects that, uh, uh, that are there in the milking environment. Part of that they settle to the bottom when the milk is allowed to stand for some time, that's what you call it as a sediment. So whether it is a floating type of or settleable type of uh, all these debris or impurities should not be there in a, in, a, in a good quality milk. Then the good quality milk is free from off flavors. If milking is done in a same bar where there is a buck that is tied, the, the warm milk that, that uh, imbibes some, some uh, uh, adsorbs some uh, uh, flavors, and such a flavor we call it as an off flavor. Or the farmer is, a, uh, it is a, uh, due to the space constraint, uh, has uh, placed some onions or stored some onions in the same place where animal is uh, uh, kept or animal is milk, then onion flavor will come, garlic flavor will come. So likewise, these are all the off flavors. There are two kinds of uh, off flavors. One is that the physically milk absorbs into this one because the warm milk soon after collection is highly receptive for these flavors. That's one thing. Second thing is uh, when microorganisms grow themselves in the in the milk because the milk is a nutritious medium, leading to the the off flavors. These are two kinds of off flavors that you get in the uh, milk. 
spoiled me obviously we have uh, a lot of objectionable of flowers of flowers okay the good quality milk should have lower microbial count when we talk about the microbial quality of the uh, milk predominantly we speak about the bacteriological quality of the milk to to lesser extent we speak about the mycological or yeast or mold in terms of that virus and other uh, parasites and all chlamydia rickets here they are difficult to detect uh, that's why they they could be there they could be there but when we talk about good milk a good milk as an indicator as a as an indicator of these microorganisms are bacteria okay their numbers would be low and milk should have normal composition and acidity when we talk about the acidity in the milk there are two kinds of acidity you know that milk contains the sugar lactose so lactose when it is acted upon by the microbial enzymes it gets converted into lactic acid that brings down the ph of the milk okay which is undesirable change so soon after drawing the uh, milk milk will be slightly acidic in nature okay so if uh, uh, microbial growth occurs and uh, it is going to change the uh, uh, acidity so it will be the lower side because that is built up of the lactic acid and second normal composition you know that milk contains several macro molecules there are several proteins the fat and uh, sugar milk sugar so microbial activity what would do these these micro organisms they need energy for their survival and multiplication they use these macro molecules bringing they they break down these big molecules into smaller one smaller one still smaller means gas so let uh, that is in the form of a gas or that is in the form of the off flavors and other things the composition of the milk get changed okay so when when the milk is handled uh, in appropriately or when there is a built up of the the microorganisms one is introduced from the outside other is the inner themselves have blown to such a uh, number that the, the these macro molecules are attacked and there is a desire, uh, undesirable change such as the increased acidity and all developed acidity and all so this the uh, the good quality of milk should be free from these things next no milk animal will add chemical impurities or contaminants into the milk so if at all they come they come by different pathways okay in in the, in the subsequent class we'll discuss about the the harmful residues and uh, uh, as hazards in the milk and their associated health impact we'll study a little later that is close to the public health but just to introduce you when when a cow is treated with antibiotic or antimicrobial for tackling the infection its residues okay whether it is one compound or multiple compound it is a parent compound or the conversion product the metabolic products the daughter compounds they are secreted into the milk okay and uh, they will enter the uh, milk supply chain reaching the human consumers okay at times these residues are not affected by pasteurization or the highest heat treatment that is expected in the domestic households and they, these uh, these residual uh, substances have got pharmacological action in the human consumers leading to the health effects okay in some cases uh, uh, you will get you will observe them as a immediate so for example penicillin penicillin allergy and all those things will uh, anticipate in many of the occasions the, tra the traces of these residues will not cause the obvious effect but upon a prolonged consumption would lead to uh, could lead to the, the chronic diseases okay so that's what is the the impact of these antimicrobials or antibiotics in the in the dairy animal production practice okay then come to the chemical residues the chemicals include the various kinds of agrochemicals such as pesticides preferably uh, insecticides the fung fungicides the rodenticides and uh, uh, other kinds of agrochemicals that are used over the crop okay so in the in the environmental cycle from the crop they will reach the animal through the feed and water 
and within the animal they get metabolized either the parent compound or again conversion product or a metabolite or an isomer of that particular substance gets uh, as a, such as pesticides and uh, uh, insecticides uh, they will get they will get secreted into the milk so these are also many such classes of substances are not inactivated by pasteurization not uh, uh, reduced in uh, quantity by by uh, the heat treatment so they will be there in the, in the product and develop it in the public health okay this this residue itself is a very big uh, uh, area in the ph that uh, we will study subsequently okay so ultimately uh, a, a, a milk which is intended for public distribution should be free from all these uh, physical chemical or biological entities that have that have the public health implications because they act as hazard and they pose risk to the animals okay and the, the concept of food chain is clear to you when we talk about the milk supply chain uh, we should avoid entrance of these not only at one point at several points in the supply chain ultimately the consumer has to be protected that's what is the aim okay and for this only we apply in the, in the uh, advanced uh, dairy production systems uh, we apply what we call it as uh, the quality management systems okay they ensure this now the various steps involved this diagram represents the supply chain of uh, one uh, uh, see for example we are starting from the cows the milk is transported chilling from um, chilling again uh, it is converted to the processing plant from processing plant it is sent to the retailing or wholesale uh, marketing so from retailing it will reach the consumer's doorstep okay let it be raw milk or milk products if it is a raw milk the shelf life is uh, uh, less that's why immediately that is uh, consumed if it is a uh, uh, self stable type of uh, product that stays for a long time either at a particular temperature or at a room temperature so that is used depending on the product's uh, shelf life that is used this is in nutshell the supply chain of any milk or milk product in uh, in country like india okay so when we see this okay you can refer a few documents that are there they are country specific but the general uh, uh, guidelines are same for all so this is what i have taken from one fao document so the steps are the hygiene should be followed at the milk production units it starts from the farm okay from the farm milk is uh, transported to the processing unit so from production to the processing unit the transportation has to be hygienic okay within the processing plant hygiene has to be managed until the product is aseptically packed when it is aseptically packed then it is stored transiently depending on again the product attribute for some time okay afterwards it is uh, it is distributed so this is what we call it as the marketing so after marketing the, the consumer buys the products from the market shelf and they consume it according to its intended use so starting from the raw ingredients until the product is supplied to the ultimate consumer this is what is the milk supply chain we have to ensure that no microorganism okay no microbial toxin no physico chemical impurities we call them as residues in chemical terms they should be introduced at any point in time otherwise they will affect this trade why india even though it is surplus we have around 180 million uh, uh, metric tons of milk produced okay we are number one in the world but we are not the number one exporters of the milk and milk products the reason being these impurities okay uh, the, the, the the physical agents the chemical agents the biological agents are so much they act as barriers to the trade and especially in the resign of the world trade organization they are taken as sps 
space in the sense they are potential barriers to the trade because they are they are included in the sps there is a detailed discussion on this we have in the later part but at this point of time sps stands for sanitary and phytosanitary measures okay based on the scientific evidence so based on the pharmacological effect based on the health effect so we identify these agents as potentially harmful to the health of the whom of the public so they are of public health significance so since these physical chemical biological entities we simply call them as hazard they pose to the risk to the public health so they should not be there okay and that's what is the today's topic they should not be there where all they are anticipated and how all we should see that you see that hygienic and safe milk production practices it includes where all they are introduced so that we can address okay let it be let it be the uh, trivial or conventional milk production system or let it be the organized milk production system where in the total quality management system is in place so the the basic principles of hygiene are same they can be extrapolated at all these levels okay so now we'll uh, start our discussion with the hygienic practices to be followed at the primary production unit that is a dairy farm okay so what kind of sanitation of the farm uh, sanitation of the equipment how the cow should be these are all the things that need to be discussed and then comes the transportation part the milk procured i mean uh, uh, produced by these cows has to be procured by the milk collection centers okay production procurement procurement means gathering okay uh, collection okay they have to be individual farmers it has to be collected this is what we call it as a procurement so for that it has to undergo a process of transportation from the farm to the processing unit or collection unit first and then processing unit so hygiene has to follow this this supply chain then within the farm there are certain general guidelines that we have to follow okay then we have to clean and disinfect all the plant equipment premise everything aseptically pack it and if at all it has to be stored there should be proper storage of the product proper transportation of the product okay all these things we have to ensure this is what is hygienic uh, milk production practices here the term milk also includes the milk products okay let us begin with the primary production unit and what you study in the management as clean milk production practices they are they are restricted up to the 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 farm okay until it is supplied to a, uh, a milk collection center but this what we are studying clean milk production practices are part of this one only or whatever the hygienic milk production practices that we follow at the farm okay these are nothing but clean milk productions okay the way in which we see is different but basically the principles are same good milking hygiene is essential okay underline this milking hygiene when we say milking hygiene there are various facets associated with the milking hygiene okay whether you milk the animal with a milking machine or manually by hand whether it is a hand or a teat uh, cluster they should be hygienic okay that's what is the basic requirement the milkers hands should be sanitized before gathering or acquiring the milk from the animal next often we use cloths for cleaning the udder udder and teat okay that cloth must be clean okay and the person who is milking should be in the good health if the person is suffering from tuberculosis can cough and can contaminate the milk the person is suffering from salmonella typhi or a typhoid infection or paratyphoid salmonella paratyphoid paratyphi arv so they can introduce if the water that is used here for milking purpose okay because you have to wash the udder no so if it is having vibrio color so then it can potentially transmit the vibrio into into vibrio organisms into the milk okay that's why the milkers hygiene is very important 
in in managemental courses you have studied they should not chew they should not have any bad habits spitting habits and all they should not apply their saliva and other things they should not use while milking they they uh, not permitted uh, oils and other lubricants they cannot apply they should not apply that's what is related with the uh, factors related to the milker sizing then comes the milking machine milking machines we expect when they when a farmer keeps over 8 to 10 or more cows uh, uh, manual milking becomes a difficult uh, task that's why they will go for a machine milking and all organized uh, farms will have the machines for milking the milk from the animal these milking machines hygiene is also very important okay the machine clusters should be properly cleaned they should be properly maintained the liners should be properly replaced okay otherwise there is build up of the microorganisms when microorganisms they build up in the in the in the, in the rubber linings it's very difficult uh, uh, to remove okay one thing because they form the biofilms second thing is that if they are introduced even in few numbers in the milk that number you know that generation interval in the in the uh, of the microorganisms and milk is a good nutrient good ph good uh, Uh, temperature, uh, abundance of nutrients that make microbial population to flare up in the milk. That's why if you won't introduce, okay, making uh, aseptic is not possible when it comes to the contaminating organisms. We can keep their number as low as possible. Pathogens zero, okay. Pathogens zero. Contaminating organisms or the saprophytes, what we call it, is they who are not they are not associated with the disease, but they are they can potentially spoil the product. or would lead to the reduced shelf life their numbers should be reduced to the acceptable level okay what are those levels how to meet them we will discuss subsequently but in today's class you just understand that so the hygiene of the milker is very important the milking process whether it is manual or the machine milking hygiene has to be followed next immediately after milking now the milk has been animal has been milked or few animals have been milked into a single single bucket of a milking machine okay container okay now the requirement is immediate cooling so what we do in the organized farms immediately the moment the milk is acquired from the animal that will go into a cooler okay milk cooler we call it as milk cooling tank okay wherever uh, the, uh, the 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 facility is a type of organized one okay but if you feel talk about india majority 70% of the milk production in india is in the unorganized sector okay so we cannot expect uh, uh, the tanks okay rather for the rather cooling tanks i mean so what can be done is immediately as early as possible this milk has to be supplied to the milk collection center this is what our karnataka milk federation that that does this job they have uh, this cooperative sector they have all these facilities as much as possible nearer to the farmers doorstep so that as long as, uh, they, as soon as they milk the animal they will bring the milk and supply to the nearest milk collection center this is what has been uh, uh, done that's why it is uh, it is one of the noticeable sector uh, after mother dairy and all amul and all you know uh, when you talk about karnataka milk federation likewise the other state federations are also working likewise other private dairy farms are also they are working in that okay so the next what is the next requirement cooling then the basic question arises why we have to cool if we cool keep the milk like that only what will happen you know that india india is a tropical country the temperature is very invariable what is our body temperature 37 degrees centigrade okay what is the outside temperature it will be depending on the region whether it is the uh, foothills of himalaya or it is rajasthan depending on the local condition we say 25 degrees plus one because tropical climate average amount of water as a whole country so which is very consider the mesophiles okay the mesophiles if it is a temperature zone for the for the flaring up of that is why what we do when majority when you organize uh, categorize these uh, microorganisms especially bacteria as cyclophiles mesophiles thermophiles and thermodurics 
okay we'll discuss about this little later but at this point of time these psychrophiles are the cold living organisms even if you keep the milk in chilling country conditions they tend to grow but their number is very less okay then what is the predominant microorganism that is present these are mesophiles and these mesophiles which are in many numbers if you can lower down the temperature of the milk they their their multiplication is halted suppose they are n in number the n only will stay for some time that's what is our requirement until the milk is pasteurized until the milk is subjected for further heat treatment or some other product making so this is what we ensure to keep the microbial number as low as possible and to avoid the multiplication one becoming two for that we go for the chilling of the milk and it should be as soon as possible again you remember the basic principles of uh, microbial uh, doubling okay within 18 to 20 minutes the bacteria divides so keep that in mind okay even if you leave for 20 minutes there is a doubling however it's not as we anticipate here the kinetic modeling of uh, uh, this if you see so that is that is that is not dependent on just like mathematics the geometric uh, progression 2 4 6 2 4 8 not like that because there are certain antimicrobial factors also in the milk okay there is lysozyme there is a, a lp system uh, there is a, there is a bifidobacter uh, bifidobacter uh, bifidobacter there are many more antimicrobial uh, immunoglobulins they are all present in the, in the milk they will also be simultaneously working soon after collection of the milk so when you talk about the net net, uh, net uh, increase in the number of microorganisms it is uh, it is it is uh, it is the sum of all okay so one is the temperature favoring the ph favoring the nutrients favoring the inhibition by antimicrobial factors and uh, the uh, ultimate aim is the reflection in the milk is so Uh, is is dependent on these factors. Okay, so now we know that the milk microbial count can be kept as low as possible by chilling the milk. So it is a basic requirement. Now, when we say, as a as a scientist, if you say that oh, chilling is essential, then comes the engineering part. How to achieve that? So there are bulk milk cooling tanks. okay so milk cooling tanks so the high bulk you gather milk from many sources so that's why bulk milk so at various capacities they are available small scale dairy farmers can afford it okay or if it is not possible they can go for a community type of thing and if at all they are members of cooperative state federation so obviously the state federation itself provides such facilities so one basic thing which is the extension point is here is that we have to, as a veterinarian we have to do extension and convince the farmers is as soon as the milking is done supply the milk to the collection center that's what is the thing the remaining aspects are discussed right the hot environment here okay hot in the sense not like rajasthan and all hot here warmer environment here that is uh, that is very conducive for the growth of the microorganisms leading to spoilage of the product if you keep the milk like that within 3 to 4 hours milk gets spoiled okay milk gets spoiled it is no more stable for any product making or human consumption that is why cooling is very much essential cooling is very much essential to prevent the multiplication of the bacteria again again remove from your mind chilling will kill the bacteria no the chilling will not kill the microorganisms you know the kinetics of growth curve you know at various temperatures so chilling is going to prevent bacterial multiplication doubling what we call it is okay the dairy sanitation dairy here is farm dairy farm okay the dairy farm sanitation has to be a important aspect when we talk about hygiene and sanitation the hygiene is brought about by sanitation process that's what is sanitation is one of the step in the in 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 preserving the uh, uh, the the uh, in maintaining the hygiene that's sanitation so what are all the things uh, that need to be sanitized number one where the milk is held 
the receptacle the can the bucket the pail so these are the things that need to be properly sanitized okay and we should follow a proper order first and foremost thing is that what kind of material it should be it should be non reactive non corrosive should not have any paint and should not have any uh, protrusions within outside so that the cleaning becomes very difficult so you have to develop such a ergonomic ergonomic design okay engineering design wherein there are no uh, cracks or there are no corners that are left within the uh, these receptacle wherein there is lodging of the the soil what we call it as the soil here is, is this soil does not mean that outside soil where plant grows okay this soil is built up of a milk stone uh we you know that milk contains uh, the minerals such as calcium and all with a pro protein bridging okay it gets adhere to the corner if it adheres to the corner the bacterial colonies or bacteria biofilms they grow grow in those corners until unless your uh, your sanitization process or cleaning process reach these edges and ridges okay the cleaning will not be effective when milk comes in contact with during the next heap stage these organisms again freely they will get detached and enter into the milk increasing the milk microbial count that is why all these milk receptacles must be properly sanitized using a universal sanitization procedure okay what is that procedure our people scientists have worked our uh, stakeholders have worked and they have found out that by doing this we can keep the microbial count at lower number uh, what is that generalized one this is the procedure what is that procedure cleaning procedure you see first and foremost is by the time the milk is empty the can should be kept inverted why you have to keep inverted there should not be any residual milk so that should be available in any of the milk receptacle okay then you wash the can can or uh, here it is i am talking about cans the same thing apply to the any receptacle that is used in the dairy farm with a cold water cold water means you need not keep the uh, 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 water in the fridge and then drink cold water in the sense tap water tap or tepid water what we call it as okay tap water whichever is depending on the local condition that temperature this is what is known as the cold water initial stage is to remove as much milk that is uh, remaining in the receptacle as possible okay which is achievable using this cold water then you put the uh, warm detergent again you underline this warm why warm you know detergent efficiency is increased by increasing in the temperature okay. sure. so it. this warming should be such that that will help the penetration of the detergent into into the deeper aspect of what we call it as the milk stone earlier milk stone or residual milk okay so you can you you can dislodge what this detergent will do detergent will help us help us in dislodging the 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 residual milk or the milk stone okay if the milk stone is very much uh, rather than using the term milk stone let me use here the soil okay soil means all that which is uh, other than the material that is uh, say for example stainless steel or aluminum alloy or some uh, uh, food grade plastic whatever it is made up of other than that is all soil only so to dislodge the soil this detergent helps to penetrate because they are all surfactant you no know? they are all surface active substances they will help in the dislodging and this is hazened by scrubbing okay scrubbing with a brush various kinds of brushes are available so using these scrubbers or the brush with the application of the detergent you see that all that milk soil that is left on the on the on the utensil is removed now you have dislodged but still it is adhering to the surface you use again the normal water to rinse that okay is that clear to you first you remove all the residual milk by inverting the can 
apply the cold water rinse it scrub it with a warm detergent then rinse that detergent with a cold water or normal water then you go for sterilization process sterilization is don't keep it in your mind you will keep the can in a hot air oven or in a autoclave and then sterilize here it is sanitization process the sterilization sanitization the disinfection all those things will study little later the terminological differences but we are reducing the microorganisms as much as possible to the extent of 99.99 okay so if me ask so even after this sir 1.01 percent is remaining yes it may remain okay but that is not attainable many times you intend to sterilize but this sterilization is not a absolute sterilization that you that is there in your mind that we expect in the lab in uh, ovens and uh, uh, autoclaves this sterilization is a sanitization okay we use either boiling water or the steam for this purpose wherever it is possible the devices are there steam is best if steam is not available you go for boiling water hot water okay and after this uh, uh, many times what happens the, there are certain days where boiling water or steam is not possible then you can go for the chemical uh, sanitizing reasons you can use a hypochlorite or concentration and all will study subsequently or there are many dairy sanitizers that are available means that have been approved as a food grade because even if some some residues you cannot use the phenolic type of uh, uh, sanitizers here you cannot use because the phenolic residues may stay okay you cannot use formalin here okay because the residue may stay that's why there are certain food grade kind of uh, uh, dairy sanitizers that are available for the sanitization of the equipment they can be purchased and they must be used as per the manufacturer's instructions the last process many times forget uh, farmers forget this is a dry can drying the can drying the can means you keep that in inverted wherever possible you blow the Uh, hot air, okay, so that it becomes dry. Or if no facilities available, keep simply keep upside down with good aeration. So that will enhance, that will enhance the efficiency of this entire process. Okay, so this is how you have to uh, at the end of the usage, the cans have to be uh, sanitized this way, if not sterilized. Okay, and they should be kept ready for the next use. now i want to use it before using don't use this cans like this this has been already done at least you give one steam or hot water uh rinse before using it for the next time okay if you follow this uh your your problems with respect to the microbial contamination from these milking equipments is solved then milking machines milking machines uh, it must be cleaned uh, in sequence is same okay it must be cleaned with uh, the cold water initially then we use the cip cip means without dismantling the machine okay we introduce the uh, air detergents in the, the water through certain uh, circulations okay this is what we call the cleaning in place or cleaning in place type of cleaning okay then rinse it with hot water and uh, these rubber rubber devices and all there is built up of the microorganisms constantly keep on replacing them regular at regular intervals uh, so that they perform well and they will not contaminate the milk uh, this is the hygiene of the uh, milk receptacles or utensils and milking machines at the farm itself we are still in the farm now it comes to the cows the proper milking sequence is very important when we talk about the dairy farm so some animals will be having the mastitis and you know that there are two types of mastitis again the later half of my discussion is on mastitis so, okay we'll discuss that at this point of time you just understand that those animals that are suffering from mastitis should be milked at the last okay you identify those animals that are mastitis you can keep them at the end okay preferably in a separate enclosure 
uh, apart uh, away from these healthy animals. Okay, that's uh, preferred. If facility is not available, if the same partners you cannot expect. Whatever we uh, say here in the books, they will not they will not be available due to resource constraint. Even if in a single uh, uh, dairy days, you see that they are away from these healthy animals as much as possible. Okay, then these animals should be after the milk collection from healthy animals is over. Okay, and someone else or the same person distributes them uh, to the uh, supplies them not distributes supplies them to the milk collection center. Then you think of milking these animals. Okay, or some other person has carried these this milk. Then you milk these animals. After milking these animals, discard all milk. Mastitic milk is not a market milk. Okay, when it is not a market milk, you will not get payment because it is not a merchantable uh, merchant. It is not a uh, good that can be merchandised. That is why mastitic milk is not a market milk. Keep it in mind. Okay, then I am uh, uh, supplying the mastitic milk. Uh, it has been a practice, and nobody has uh, raised a question. So every day is not a Sunday, as I told you. Every day is not a Sunday. Uh, one fine day, you will be caught and you will be penalized, or you will be, you will be removed from the, the list of suppliers. That's why the farmers must be educated. Never ever supply mastitic milk to a dairy. It may go unnoticed one day, two day, but the penalty will be such that you will be removed from the uh, society itself. Like that. Uh, measures to proper robust extension we have to educate our farmers this is this is need of the hour for us for uh, in front of us uh, on, on this day okay now you know that as veterinary uh, graduates you know that they whenever the animal suffers from mastitis that must have been treated for some uh, antimicrobials using some antimicrobials and earlier i talked about these antimicrobial residues can emerge in the milk and they have a own topical significance. So, as long as the animal is under antibiotic treatment, so long this milk should not be consumed. Okay, should not, and it is not a market milk. Okay, this should be discarded properly. Okay, how to discard and all discussions uh, later on. And one more thing you see, even though I have stopped the drug, say for example, it is a three days or five days antibiotic treatment. My three days or five days antibiotic treatment is over today. Okay, today evening, it is over. Okay, from tomorrow or morning onwards, can I supply the milk to because animal is all right, mastitis has subsided because of the antibiotic treatment, and can I supply the milk from tomorrow onwards to the society? I am a farmer. The question. Okay, the answer is no. Why no? You know. You know that every every uh, drug when it is injected, uh, therapeutic drug when it is injected into the animal body, it has got its own kinetics. Okay, you know you calculate uh, it as a T half, PKPD, and all you know how it is distributed and metabolism. You know, even though you stop the antibiotic in the uh, in the evening today, tomorrow morning also these antibiotics will be there in the body in some reservoirs reserves and. They will be getting secreted, you know, the depleting kinetics. Okay, slowly, 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 that get eliminated from the body in the form of a urine, in the form of a dung, in the form of a sweat, in the form of a saliva, in the form of whatever it is, the root of excretion of that one, and that depends on a particular antibiotic that is antibiotic specific. Okay, some antibiotics or anti helminthics also. They have zero withdrawal period. Zero withdrawal period means uh, there is no residue also, uh, at all that uh, appears within four hours, within six hours, entire kinetics is over. No residue that can, or there is no secretion into the milk at all. The, the drug stays in the blood itself. No secretion into the milk, then milk is safe. Okay, so you follow the withdrawal period, which is not universal. Which is specific to a particular molecule of the antibiotic or antihelminthic or veterinary drug. So that has to be followed. And at this period, we call it as withdrawal period. Withdrawal period means you have to withdraw from supplying to the milk collection society. 
what milk don't give this milk it is not a market milk if it is not followed a withdrawal period so you got now when i talked about market milk the milk which is uh, which is having the residues is not a market milk the milk which is drawn from the mastitic udder or a quarter is not a market milk. okay next what will happen the impact is as i told you earlier again we will discuss that in later in bit detail later on these residues are having the pharmacological action in the human consumers they may cause the allergy they may they may lead to the antimicrobial resistance within the gut microflora or if at all you are producing certain milk products these milk products will be affected you know that there are certain fermented products that need to be produced since there are already traces of antimicrobials in the milk they inhibit these starters good bacteria so your product is not fine because the fermentation has not occurred that's why they are having the negative effect residues on the on the product itself second on the public health effects okay so these are the impacts of uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials when we talk about the cows next other aspects of that as and when uh, Uh, the chapter is coming. We will discuss that. Now let us go to the next. With the from the dairy farm itself, the milk is transported transported in the vessels. Okay, these milk receptacles or the vessels are the cans of the tanks. The basic built up or the design of these cans and uh, a bigger can is nothing but tank. If you make a can bigger and mount it on a vehicle, that becomes a movable tank. Okay, transport vehicle what you call it as. Okay. so but ultimately the, the 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 when we talk about the public health hygiene it is same only okay the same principles the what we discussed earlier about the can that applies here also now transportation of milk from the farm okay or milk collection center to the dairy processing unit or a factory okay we call it as bulk milk transport system bulk means many places the milk has been collected so what is this again it is a bigger still bigger can okay can was a smaller bucket was smaller can was bit bigger okay cooling tank was bit bigger and uh, this bulk uh, milk transport vehicle or a tank is still bigger that's why the gradation it's only size that matters the basic principles of hygiene and cleaning and all they remain the same okay so uh, one very important aspect associated with the transport is the maintenance of the temperature we should see that in no case the temperature rises above 10 degree centigrade okay it should be 4 okay never beyond 10 if it is more than 10 then there is a spoilage and other things will occur then there are various systems of transportation of uh, the milk okay uh, to the processing uh, unit the general uh, uh, requirements within the processing plant you now the milk has uh, come all the way from the farm okay which could be few kilometers to several hundred kilometers okay that that goes by length of uh, milk supply chain or a loops that have been incorporated within the supply chains we call them as uh, routes of procurement of milk okay so the milk has reached the processing plant now there are certain uh, general guidelines that uh, determine uh, that are dependent on the hygiene okay number one within the milk processing plant or a factory the floor okay the floor must be inert easily washable at the same time easily usable also okay walls walls should be hygienically designed they should be easily washable easily cleanable and they should be inert non reactive and we say that about 2 meters from the bottom the floor the wall should be erected and it should be having tiles or easily washable type of inert material it should not be painted okay painted even if you paint it with a light color which is uh, which is permitted in the in the, in the food pack okay and doors that have been uh, incorporated here in the plant okay many times the doors 
door what they should, they should not be open with a palm they should not be operated okay because the one worker is going uh, within the plant and other person is also coming and touching the same door door itself will act as a source of contamination what we expect in the dairy plant is uh, 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 such a doors that are self closable okay or they are not operated by hands they are operated by some other means okay there are various variants in that and all the windows and all they are insect proof no insect should come in okay if it comes and falls in the product so that is a contamination no? physical and then microbial later on so insect proof windows the ventilators all these things uh, there should not be entry and when we talk about the uh, floor also rodents and other uh, vermin should not enter that's the next requirement so in simply patel i want to talk about in generalized terms all that is there in the dairy plant processing plant okay should be easily sanitizable easily cleanable okay i need to demonstrate that cleanliness using appropriate laboratory tests okay that's what is requirement in the plant okay the utensil hygiene also just like what we talk about the cans we, again it follows there are two ways by which the utensils and all they are cleaned within the dairy uh, plant one is manual dismantle that unit clean it the way we talk for the can okay second is the cip clean pasteurizer homogenizer and all they cannot be easily dismantled because they have very fine fine or delicate uh, tubing systems so they should be there should be a detergent they there should be hot water cold water the acids and alkalis at times so they should be easily pumpable into the circuit and wash should be there should be facility to drain that wash and that should go to effluent treatment plant so this this should be the requirement and such a hygiene should be demonstrated you cannot say that no no i have passed the uh, sufficient alkali acid or uh, detergent hot water steam everything is over sir so there is no need to check it's not like that that should be demonstrated when you use a rinse method or a swab method the microbial count should be as per recommended limits what are the limits and how to do and all we'll discuss it later okay so within the dairy processing plant the we follow uh, majority of the times uh, the cip type of uh, cleaning okay cleaning in place and various uh, uh, basic steps that are involved with respect to uh, the cleaning and sanitization of the dairy equipment include rinsing with the water okay this is a normal water okay then hot water then with the detergent a particular sequence of detergent then final uh, rinse and then we go for uh, disinfection so disinfection sometimes i am i am using the word disinfection sometimes i am using the word uh, sanitization and sometimes i am using the word sterilization there are various degrees of attaining microbial freedom okay there are some some uh, definition differences in that there is a separate topic on that i'll talk about that little later and whenever you go for sanitization okay you can use a uh, uh, steam okay at 85 degrees centigrade for 10 to 15 minutes or you can use the hot water okay higher is the temperature lower is the time okay and vice versa that's what is the time temperature combination when you are using the uh, low steam high steam uh, hot water likewise okay then the processing is over then the product has come out it has to be packed the packing material should be of good grade the primary packing what we call it it should have say for example it is a milk the milk has to be uh, packed in the in the, in the polythene uh, uh, pouches this this material should be of good grade the labeling should be the ink that is used for labeling should be of good grade okay it should be non toxic non reactive so it should be inert okay and there should not be leaching of the any polymer into the milk so that otherwise it will have the impact on the public health you know that plastic has got a shelf life of about 400 years okay it it, it half life not shelf life half life is 400 years and 400 years is going to survive one thing that's why plastic is a menace number one 
Number two, it is made up of simple monomers. They are all polymers of some some uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, monomers. Okay. So when we talk about this, all this majority of these monomers are having health impact, health effect. So the material that you are using should be inert. That should not come out. That's what is and uh, get introduced to the product. That's what you have to ensure. Uh, this is with respect to the uh, packing. And the packing should be such that sufficiently it should hold the product. It should be tamper proof. For during transportation, it should not easily break or uh, tear away or the packing, uh, the sealing of the packing, the uh, opening. These things should not happen. This is the requirement of uh, the packaging. We have Indian Ministry of Packaging. Several of the such units are operational in India that exclusively does work on uh, the packaging. Okay, instead we have National Institute of Packaging. Uh, we call it as Indian Institute of Packaging. Okay. Now, the hygienic uh, milk handling again with respect to the uh, processing unit. Now, how to store these finished products? The finished product where they are kept, there should not be any entry of the insects, vermin, rodent, etc. Kept at an appropriate temperature and relative humidity. The product should have, should maintain the shelf life during the storage. These are the requirements. Next, hygienic transportation of the product I am talking about. Product, now the processing of everything is over, packed. Now it has to be uh, transported to the retail unit or a wholesale unit. No? That way. Again, the design of the vehicle, the appropriate conditions, temperature, time temperature combinations. So within uh, that, one, okay, if it is a longer distance, how to follow it? If it is a shorter distance, how to follow? How should be design of the vehicle? All those things that matter when we talk about the hygiene. Then this is very important, personal hygiene. Persons are involved everywhere. Number one, they should not suffer from any chronic or infectious diseases. Number two, they should follow proper etiquettes of food handling okay and number 3 they should they should uh, they should be tested and demonstrable say for example you cannot say that sir no i don't have any diarrhea i am somnolent of you cannot say that i am typhoid free that should be demonstrable how by fecal examination demonstrating that there is no salmonella detected that's what is demonstrable okay one is attainable Second one is demonstrable. Demonstrable means to the third party. And whenever we talk about the total quality management uh, system implementation, that should be demonstrable. Okay, attainable first, then demonstrable. Next, we should have within a processing plant a, a, a laboratory to ensure all these things, all these hygienic measures to ensure them. There should be a laboratory that should be located. Okay, this is all about the hygienic milk production uh, within a, within a uh, milk supply chain. Okay. Now let us uh, discuss about some other questions. Okay, small topic. Okay, it is the same topic only continuation of the same topic. So you know that you you go to the again initial uh, uh, our discussion at the farm. At the farm, when we talk about if it is a healthy cow that introduce less number of microorganisms. If the, if the, uh, the, the udder is in flames, okay, udder is in flame or quarter is in flame, you know that cow has got four udders, buffalo also same thing, sheep and goat too, okay, the, the, uh, the uh, air also just like cow. So four quarters or two quarters they have. Each one we call it as the quarter, okay. So in sheep and goat also we call it as quarter only. Actually, it should be half, but we say quarter because the convention we carried the term from cattle. That's it. whatever it is, the anatomical usage of the term. Okay. Udder, you know, udder is a is a glandular tissue where the milk is uh, synthesized and secreted into the lumen of the uh, this udder. Okay, you have got the system uh, and the there the milk is uh, stored and there is a milking process, milk comes out. This is normal. And you know that milk is uh, sterile when it is uh, synthesized and it is no more sterile when it is uh, milk. Okay, you know that, all that I discussed earlier. If the, if the infectious agents, okay, either environmental, 
majority of them are environmental or those that are transmitted from animal to animal okay contagious or environmental so these organisms when inv they invade the granular tissue or the udder we call such a inflammation of the udder as a mastitis mastitis is of two kinds one is what we call it as a clinical mastitis clinical mastitis is means uh, means the cow is having the symptoms either there is fever there is a, there is a, uh, off feed recumbency whatever it is there are changes in the cow number 2 changes in the udder udder is inflamed hot to touch okay it is warm and uh, painful okay and when you palpate the udder there are there are some some hard things changes in the abnormal changes in the udder or the teeth okay number 1 change change with respect to cow health number 2 change changes with respect to udder and the teeth third changes with respect to milk that is produced the milk produced is either having the blood i have having pus uh is is uh, uh, is a coagulating type of thing or is very much watery that all goes by the different kinds of infectious agents that are entered okay so whenever these three changes are there either in the health of the cow or in the udder and the teeth or the third one uh, the changes in the milk itself we call such a mastitis as a clinical mastitis okay there is a second type of uh, mastitis wherein there are no these obvious changes what i talked about okay cow appears apparently healthy if you palpate the udder there are no changes and when you collect the milk and when you keep the normal milk with the mastitic uh, animal milk there is no change in the milk so apparently okay okay normal even then the animal will be suffering from mastitis when you use the suitable laboratory test you have identified that it is mastitic okay in practical you will understand how to do that but in theory you just try to understand that uh, there are no changes such a animal it is suffering from mastitis however there are no obvious signs of mastitis such a mastitis we call it as sub clinical mastitis the clinical symptoms or manifestations are not obvious it is sub okay we know so in subconscious mind sub therapeutic dose sub means under okay so sub adult we say okay these are all the terms sub means not it to that one which one clinical one so if you talk about our cows dairy animals and you see if you see the prevalence of the clinical and sub clinical mastitis sub clinical mastitis is much more prevalent up to 90% compared to the clinical mastitis only 10% it is only a tip of an iceberg okay if at all there are 100 animals we have seen and we have detected the mastitis positive using a lab test or a pcr test some 10 will be clinical while 90 will be subclinical that's what is the impact of sub clinical mastitis whether animal is suffering from clinical mastitis or sub clinical mastitis the microbial count has increased in the animal that you can do because inflammation of the udder means it is it is inflammation because there is there is invasion since they why 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 that invasion occurred and from what the invasion microorganisms microorganisms have invaded that has resulted in the infection and which is evident as an inflammation three eyes okay invasion infection inflammation okay these are very important in the, in the pathogenesis of the mastitis and uh, you read uh, dr bhushan m jairaus uh, publications and ppt that are available freely in google you will understand that and i have taken this uh, uh, much of these images from dr jairaus uh, uh, presentation okay so mastitis you know that what is mastitis now mastitis is inflammation of the udder and you know that each quarter of the cow udder they are not connected by Uh, they are independent they are not connected that's why a, a cow can suffer from one quarter mastitis two quarter mastitis or all four quarter three quarter mastitis or all four quarter mastitis okay which is inflammation of the udder and when it comes to the economic loss there is a huge economic loss that is associated with the mastitis number one loss is that the mastitic animals milk is rejected 
Number two is that there is a treatment that should be given to the cow for the recovery. Okay. Number three, at times there is a death of uh, there is a death of the cow, or in developed countries, what they do if the mastitis becomes untreatable, the animal has to be culled. So there is loss of the cow itself. Why it is suffering from mastitis? So there is a huge loss uh, uh, to the dairy farmers whenever animal suffers from mastitis. Okay, that is why whenever we say the concerns associated with the mastitis, they are either due to the animal health or public health. Why public health? These animals need to be treated. That's why antibiotic residue issue. We have to go for uh, withdrawal period. Okay, if it is not observed withdrawal period, public health effect. So that's why mastitis is having multiple uh, uh, facets. And as I told you earlier, mastitis is of two kinds: clinical mastitis, subclinical mastitis. The clinical mastitis is less observed, while subclinical mastitis is more observed. Okay, and it can only be detected by lab test. Okay, or cow side test such as California mastitis test. Okay, it can be detected while while clinical mastitis can be detected by the changes in the cow, um, the udder, or the milk. And various kinds of organisms are responsible for mastitis. Okay, various kinds of organisms. And the sources of mastitis, when you talk about the infectious agents here, as I told you earlier, either they are from endogenous because they have come from the cow itself, or they are exogenous because they have entered through the teat canal and then they have uh, colonized the uh, udder. So that's why any any endogenous source could be a uh, in uh, this uh, bedding material or a soil or a water or a milker, uh, all these things are the source of uh, infection. <coughs> so, large number of bacteria, as I told you, the mastitis could be due to various species of streptococcus, various species of staphylococcus that are associated with the contagious mastitis or the, the coliforms, most importantly, the E. coli that are associated with environmental mastitis. Okay, we get acute mastitis uh, whenever these organisms are invaded into the other. Less uh, uh, prevalent are these Pseudomonas, Cerecia, Coronibacterium, various species of fungi, okay, including yeast and mold or mycoplasma. Uh, they are all associated with the mastitis. At times, even the chlamydial agents, they are associated with mastitis, chlamydial agents, okay. Even rickets also, but the, uh, the detection of these things is uh, very less. So, several factors that uh, determine whether a cow suffers from a mastitis or not, we call them as the cow factors or environmental factors or the factors associated with the organisms. The, if, the, if the organism is uh, a contagious type of organism such as staphylococcus, which is having a lot of virulence mechanisms, that is even if few numbers have entered into the other, that will lead to the mastitis. These are uh, virulence, pathogenicity, drug resistance among these organisms is important. Cow, whenever the cow is uh, immunosuppressed or it's having some uh, some other trauma or an injury uh, or is suffering from some other health ailments, then that is more prone for the mastitis. So, for example, uh, we have studied in uh, Chamraj Nagar, those cows that were having the warts on the teeth, they were having more uh, 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 mastitis incidence than the healthy one. Okay, the warts, the tumors and uh, the other factors, the environmental factors, say for example, the, the barn is not clean, the farmer has not maintained the hygienic uh, uh, conditions within the farm, or the, the floor is undulant, it's very hard, so then uh, these environmental factors also influence in the, in the occurrence of mastitis. So, you can say that mastitis uh, is, is a result of the, the cow factors, the, the, the organism factors, or the environmental factors. And the, the process I told you earlier, okay, as I talked, first and foremost, the organism invades. Okay, since it invades, 
it 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 affects the glandular tissue and uh, uh, nearby tissue with the infection to counteract this the body responds okay body responds that's what is known as the inflammation okay imagine infection uh, the inflammation these are the uh, sequence by which the mastitis uh, 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 proceeds if the cow's immune system defense system uh, is robust enough it will take care of this with by infiltrating the cells and cow promptly gets recovered okay second neither the cow has one nor the organism has one there is a compromised status it is for a quite a long period neither the infection uh, uh, that proceeded to a clinical mastitis phase okay now the animal recovered this lingering stage we call it as a subclinical mastitis this is what is majority of the animals there is always a dwindling or a war between the agent and the uh, cow uh, leading to a compromised state this is what we call it as subclinical mastitis okay or when organisms are too much capable of damaging the glandular tissues they are invaded the organisms are overweight in the number and uh, the leading to the changes in the in the udder or changes in the milk or at times changes in the cow health uh, this what is the thing the mastitis so this is how the 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 mastitis that that proceeds within a cow okay then how to identify mastitis there is a, a practical on that we'll discuss that at later we have a laboratory test there are some uh, cow side test such as california mastitis test they all identify these infiltrating cells this is no cells that are infiltrated into that uh, same is true with the milk so their increase in the number we detect by somatic cell count or by coagulating the dna that is present in these uh, somatic cells by such as uh, the california mastitis test the uh, the other kinds of uh, the variants of this uh, cmt okay we can culture also the but it is very costly affair because there are more than 200 different kinds of microorganisms that are associated with the mastitis that is a difficult task okay so the subclinical mastitis uh, is a really a problem in the, in the in the field condition for the management so uh, this is again uh, these are the recommendations given by you see that presentation by dr bushan m de rosa so 10 steps have been proposed prepare for the management of the mastitis prepare cows properly for milk you see that no organism enters during the milking process okay at times we go for the pre dips pre dips means before starting the milking process using these chemical substances for uh, preventing the entry during the milking process that's what is pre dip and you say that pre dips lower the risk of new infection by 70% okay that's the study number 2 have a good milking system good milking system means in india it is good milker the milker should have all hygienic measures and if at all it is organized form while using the, the the milking machine the all those precautions that we studied earlier uh, need to be followed apply and remove machine carefully if you damage the teat if you damage the uh, gla- this uh, epithelium of the teat there is there is uh, infection that is why uh, trauma or infection that's why you apply and remove as per the recommended practice dip each teat after each milking using a thermocidal dip what happens you know the milk uh, soon after uh, milking process you know in anatomy or study that the rosette of fastenberg okay so the the teat canal okay the sphincter of that that opens that kept uh, soon after milking that will be open and it keeps open for some time after the milking process the, the duration varies from breed to breed okay so during this period if you can dip the teat with a uh, teat dip we having this important uh, sanitizer so that will not allow the microbial so in a, in a great way it is going to uh, help 
in preventing the entry and thereby minimizing the mastitis. Monitor mastitis score. There are various scores that have been uh, given. Okay, so various kinds of scores. We'll study this in practical in detail. So you score the mastitis. Okay. My uh, mastitis score. Okay. Next, treat clinical cows means affected cows. Okay, and uh, withhold the milk from the public distribution. Next, segregate chronic mastitis cows and uh, uh, you milk them in the last. And if it is uh, a too much, say for example, if it is a incurable staphylococcal mastitis, there is no point in keeping such cows, culling such cows or drying them uh, such that they will not, they will no more produce the milk. Animal welfare point of view also it is important and dairy profitability point of, point of view also it is important. But in India especially, what is the, what is the fate of such cows? How to salvage them is a major issue because cow slot is banned in India. Okay, that is that's, that is something uh, difficult uh, when you talk about the Indian circumstances. Western countries, they will slaughter better. Eighth, dry treat each quarter using partial insertion techniques. We can approve the dry cow treatment at the drying out. This is what is drying out. Two months, 60 days before the calving, the cow is not milk so that sufficient nutrients are available to the calf to grow and animal regains all that nutrients it has lost during the milking or lactation period. Okay, this is what is practiced uh, in the organized dairy farms. So during this drying process, <coughs> what can be done, you know, properly this during drying some antimicrobials are injected into the animal. So, it should be partially inserted, means if you insert very much deep into that, organisms are directly introduced into the other. Okay, so that's why when you using, when you use the intramammary infusions during this drying process, partially it should be inserted and, and properly the animal has to be dried off. Keep cows clean, others free from soil and maintain hygiene in the barn. Okay, properly feed and care for cows, this is very important. You know that every milking process, good number of uh, the epithelial cells that are lining the uh, milking canal, milk treat canal, they are eroded. They have to be replaced. This requires certain cofactors, vitamins, and other mineral supplementation. It should be given. The nutrients should be given. Then only there is a healing process. If you avoid, if you don't do that, the constant uh, uh, milking process. In due course of time, if it is not replenished with the required nutrients, that would lead to the injury. Injury would lead to later on, it is going to uh, cause mastitis. That's why it has to be properly fed, especially with respect to selenium, the zinc, the micro uh, minerals, and other uh, nutrients properly. Even if the high yielding cows are not properly fed, there is, uh, there is energy imbalance. To such animals, uh, uh, they will become uh, uh, ketotic in due course of time. And this uh, subclinical ketosis would lead to the subclinical mastitis. Okay. So in other words to say, so the, the mastitis management is very important when we talk about the supply of the clean milk. And the animals should be routinely monitored for this mastitis and such animals should be appropriately taken care of especially when we talk about subclinical mastitis. Now, in a very brief way, some steps are there, like five steps I am going to talk about. Milking procedures for milk uh, for producing the high quality milk, how to follow this milking procedure, okay? So, the basic uh, prerequisites are, uh, uh, whenever uh, uh, there is uh, a milking the bar, there are some cows that are there. The basic husbandry practices, animal husbandry practices should be kept in mind. The place should be well ventilated, uh, there should be cleanliness, hygienic principles must be in place because dairy is a commercial venture. Okay, except for those uh, uh, wherein uh, they are kept as a allied uh, uh, sector to the agriculture, uh, wherein the cows are reared for a dung than a milk, that's a different kind of system. We can call it as extensive. But the majority of the dairy farmers, they keep 
some or many uh, milking animals for uh, the profitability or uh, as, as a profit oriented divisions they keep. Okay, the infected cows should be segregated and they should be milked in the last and milk should be discarded. And CMT, California Mastery Test, should be performed uh, in, the, in the, the cows. Okay, and uh, uh, the treated uh, cows should be again milked at the last, but the, whenever you are using the uh, milking machine, it should be regularly changed. And um, the milking machine's maintenance has to be properly done. Uh, there is a practice of clipping or singeing the uh, udder hairs. Udder hair means udder hairs, otherwise they are going to fall into the milk. There is singeing practice. It is not practiced in India, but somewhere in uh, Europe or America it is practiced where in very low flame is just passed through the uh, hairs, okay, that uh, the, the superficial uh, hair is just burnt out, just like you do the singeing in big slaughter like that. Okay, but it is for live animal. So you may ask the question, sir, is it going to burn? No, that much uh, hot is not used. It is a low flame and a low temperature flame. Okay, special uh, singeing gun will come using that one. The mastitis treatment should be done properly and the, the cloth that is used for milking should be properly sanitized or it is kept in good hygiene. Okay, then so strip and uh, pre dip what is this strip means strip cup before uh, the moment the milking starts you collect all the milk into a uh, strip cup what is this strip cup i'll show some other time so it is nothing but a black colored uh, mess like thing where milk is uh, just put in if at all the animal is suffering from clinical mastitis or there are changes in the milk the flakes and all those things that are going to be visible there that's why it is black color. Milk is white, it is black, that's why. Pre dip. Pre dip means before milking, dip it. Okay. Then drying and applying the things properly, so those things are already uh, discussed. Okay. So, whatever the milking procedure that we follow, it should be the proper one. Then uh, we talk about implementation of the total quality management systems in the, into the dairy business. Whenever it comes, so there, there should be the HACCP principles that should be followed properly. The, the step one is uh, we have to educate the farmers about, uh, about the benefits of uh, implementing these standardized practices. Okay, number one. Number two, there should be, there should be a team of uh, people who will uh, monitor this one. There are certain uh, uh, critical limits that have been set in. Again, these critical limits that vary from place to place. Uh, we take it as around two lakhs. Okay, there should be proper record. There should be all those seven principles of HACCP should be applied here. Okay, then the milkers and the owners they should be uh, properly uh, trained to use the standardized milking procedure. And uh, uh, likewise, the, it is a four step four is also continuation of that one. Using suitable laboratory tests, we should ensure that uh, they are all uh, compliant. And if at all there is any problem, corrective action has to be taken. Okay, so especially with respect to certain critical limits that have established. So this is what is the industrial uh, approach or the system-based approach or quality assurance uh, uh, schemes that are applied to the milk production. So this is all uh, in nutshell about uh, uh, the uh, practices that need to be implemented so that we 